Credits Roll. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of No Credits Rolled. My name is Sam Whalen, and today I'm going to be covering a smattering of news stories, my thoughts on Dragon's Dogma 2, and maybe a few bonus games. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to remind everyone to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. That includes Spotify, Apple, uh, and now YouTube as well. You can look us up, No Credits Rolled, wherever you get those services. Uh, also, if you're on Deezer, uh, I would like to keep plugging Deezer because I think it's funny. Uh, but if you are, if all my D's heads out there, uh, please leave a comment. Let me know if you're listening on Deezer. If you're feeling generous, the show also has a Patreon. You can just search No Credits Rolled on there as well. Every little bit helps. This is a semi-independent operation, which I guess really doesn't make any sense if you think about the word semi-independent. We've also got a call in line, and I want to hear from you. Call in at 856-209-0713. That's 856-209-0713. And let me know what you're playing and what I should be playing and what I should be talking about. All right, I think I got everything off the top. Let's get into our first story. The headline reads, 60% of playtime in 2023 went to six-year-old or older games, new data shows. Uh, This comes from Kotaku, uh, as well as a research firm called Newzoo. Uh, The story is from Zach Zuizen. Zuizen, I think that's right. Uh, Zach, if you're listening to this, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Uh, But he says, quote, Newzoo's data shows that just 66 titles accounted for 80% of all playtime in 2023. And 60% of that playtime was spent in games that are six years or older. In fact, in 2023, five old games, Fortnite, Roblox, League of Legends, Minecraft, and GTA V accounted for 27% of all playtime in the year. That's about a quarter for all you math heads out there. Of the 23% of playtime spent in 2023 on new games, uh, which are defined new here as being defined as two years or younger, more than half was spent in big annual sequels, like the latest Madden or NBA game. And this last part is what really uh, made me want to talk about this on the show. Zach says, quote, Only 8% of video game playtime was spent on new, non-annual titles like Diablo 4 and Baldur's Gate 3. 8% on new games. And again, for the purposes of this research, new is being classified as two years or younger, which isn't even really new if you think about it, at least by my standards. But 8% of playtime spent on these new games. So what do we do with that data, right? What does that data make you think of? For me, it shows how difficult it is for new games to break out and remain relevant, Um, especially when you're dealing with these juggernauts like a Fortnite, a Roblox, League of Legends, Minecraft, GTA V. All of these games, by the way, are 10 plus years old. Um, Crazy to think about that they're still as dominant. I think this is a trend with... Uh, lots of different kinds of media today. You, you see it a lot in movies, uh, this trend of sequels and remakes and requels that sort of dominate what people go and see and what people like to see and, in this case, what people like to play. I think it's there's the familiarity of it. I think that's the biggest thing. People are much more likely to dive into something that they already know or something based off something they know instead of just going headlong into a new property or a new experience that they might not be as familiar with. So how can new games compete when established titans like Fortnite take up so much of the player base? Uh, It's tough, right? I mean, I'm not a game developer, but I imagine it's got to be extremely tough if you're gunning, if you're making a new game and you're you're gunning for that 8% uh, of the player base, you know, that's a very small margin of the player base. And there's a lot of new games that come out every year. And again, for this research, new is two years or younger. So we're going back to 2022. Had to look at the calendar because I did not know the year but you know that's not that's not that new going back two years and they're still fighting over this eight percent of the player base now there are some exceptions like the article cited like Baldur's Gate 3 uh, and what makes something like a Baldur's Gate 3 break out and capture so many gamers right what makes it such a uh, presence in the public discussion that allows it to kind of defy this data and kind of have its own voice and its own moment in the gaming space in my opinion, I think a lot of this comes down to what kind of gamer you are. Uh, and I know it's, it's kind of cringe to use the word gamer, but I'm gonna. Uh, I think a lot of people are very casual gamers, and I don't mean that as an insult. I, I think a lot of people just, you know, they work their 9 to 5, and they come home and they hop on Fortnite or they hop on Warzone and, and you know, get destroyed by a 13-year-old 
uh, and then call it a day. But, you know, those kids, too, they those 13-year-olds, they might just only play Fortnite, right? They might only play Roblox. They might only play Warzone. And they don't really branch out a whole lot. And I think for those kind of gamers, that's why your Fortnites, your Roblox, your League of Legends, your Minecraft, your GTA 5s remain so popular because there is that constant... There's constant updates to these games. There's there's constant... There's a built-in constant player base, as we can clearly see here. And for most of these, excluding, you know, Minecraft and a GTA 5, you can hop on, you can do a match, and your time with the game can stop there. Now, that's not counting, you know, in, in Fortnite uh, and... Uh, Roblox, there's like games within games, and in Minecraft as well. We're not counting that. I mean like the the core of what the game is. League of Legends matches are a lot longer than that. But my point is you can basically, you can do whatever you do in your day-to-day life, hop into these games, get your fix of the game, and then kind of go back to your regular life. And I think that there are a lot of casual gamers that that is what they're doing. It's not, you know, they're not looking for the next groundbreaking single-player RPG, and that's okay. You know, that doesn't have to appeal to everybody. But I think that the large amount of the player base for your Fortnites is this casual audience, and it's what these uh, these Titan games kind of rely on to keep the lights on. Now, this brings us back to a Baldur's Gate 3 and what makes a game like that appeal to a more casual gamer. I think a lot of it comes down to word of mouth, Right? We're seeing that with Helldivers 2 right now as well. Uh, TikTok, Instagram, social media in general, you're seeing these clips of these games and, and it's you get the feeling of FOMO, right? the feeling of missing out. You say, oh, well, this looks like a ton of fun. Look at all these fun clips I'm seeing. I want to go play this game. I want to branch out and try something new that I might not, you know, um, that might not appeal to me just on the, the cover art alone or the, you know, the trailer for the game alone. If I'm a casual gamer and I'm seeing that this game is extremely popular, it might entice me to want to go over and give it a shot. And then maybe I'll stick with it if it's a Baldur's Gate and I get wrapped up in the story or the characters. Or if it's a Helldivers 2, I get stuck in the gameplay and I that loop of doing missions and you know I'm hooked and there's your 8% that are playing new games. I think uh, accessibility also plays a big part and it allows a new game to, to break out. How easy is the game to pick up? I know for me, I don't PC game really ever. So games like Lethal Company that I'm seeing get that social media hype and get that online presence, I'm not going to go play because one, none of my friends are on PC, and two, I don't really play on PC to begin with. So I think, so when I'm saying accessibility, I I guess I more so mean availability. How easy is the game to pick up and and purchase? What's the price point, right? Because if you're talking about a $70 game, someone that doesn't really, that might not play your single-player epics, it might be a tough sell for them to, to slap down 70 plus dollars on a game they might not even like. It's easier to get something that's free to play like a Fortnite or a Roblox or League. Minecraft's always on sale. GTA 5 is on sale a lot too. So the barrier to entry in terms of a price point for those very popular uh, old games, quote unquote old games, is a lot lower based on that as well. You're taking a lot more of a leap of faith with your $70 on a new game that you might not like, and return policies nowadays are extremely fickle, so you might just be stuck with it. This data also ties into a topic we covered, what, two episodes ago, I think? Uh, Talking about live service games. You know, I mean, of these five old games that are 27% of playtime, Fortnite, Roblox, League, GTA V, those are all live service games. I don't know if you'd count Minecraft as a live service game because... You can just do single-player stuff and that. You don't necessarily have to do online stuff. But Fortnite, Roblox, League, and GTA, those are all live service games that are ridiculously successful and ridiculously profitable. So I think that that speaks to, from a uh, company standpoint, from a brand standpoint, the benefits of a live service game and what all these various companies want when they make a live service game. They want it to become a household name that you know, 10 years down the line, people are still playing and still making up more than a quarter of gamers' playtime. Unfortunately, uh, that that um, that diamond in the rough that a lot of companies are looking for is a lot harder nowadays to get to than it was back when Fortnite came out, back when League started. I don't even know when that was. I don't play League, but probably a long time ago. It's tough to make that breakout hit. I, You know, one that comes to mind... For me, is Apex Legends. When that game came out, it had the backing of Respawn, 
the folks that like myself that were Titanfall fans, working some of those mechanics into a live service battle royale is kind of what made it have some staying power. But for every Apex, there's, you know, a Suicide Squad kill the Justice League or uh, what's another terrible example? I was playing this game called Hawked, H-A-W-K-E-D. Um, that's like a, it's like an extraction shooter where you're, you're underground. The servers are still on, but it's not really getting a lot of hype. I mean, there's, for every Apex, there's a dozen other live service games that are going to fail. So it's really, it's like the definition of feast or famine when it comes to these live service games. And I, I really think that the, these five Titans that we're talking about here that are live service are very much the exception. And not the rule. But I think companies see dollar signs and they want to take their stab at it without really giving the proper um, foundation, the proper foundation for what these games, these live service games need to have a successful launch and to have the staying power to make people want to continue to play them. I think a lot of the time, you know, we, companies just want that instant hit, that instant gratification, and that instant profit, of course, but they don't really think of it uh, particularly far ahead. I mean, sure, you might get a content roadmap, right? I mean, you know, shout out Marvel's Avengers. I I reinstalled that the other day and and played a little bit of it just because I I love that game so much. But that game had a content roadmap that ended up being a detriment to the game itself because they had to keep moving deadlines and they had to keep, you know, reworking what the content map was And that's the surefire way to kill your live service game because if you set up this roadmap where there are dates to hit and you don't hit those dates, people are going to fall off because there's no new content and there's no reason to keep coming back to this game. We get into the discussion of crunch, right, where it's something like a Fortnite. I I don't remember. I don't have the details in front of me, but I remember there was a crunch story about that. And when you play Fortnite and they're pumping out new content every two weeks, whether that be unvolting items or putting new things in or changing up the gameplay, you know, it's a juggernaut for Epic, so they, they can dedicate the resources and the time to that. But there is an element of crunch to that where you, you have to keep feeding the beast. So on one hand, you know, you've got the content roadmap that could, you know, be your death, your death now if you don't end up following it. But then you've also, you don't want to overwork your workers to the point that they're crunching to keep up with the live service trend. And that's not even mentioning the development teams that work on these live service games that might get shut down within a month of their release. You know, rest in peace, Knockout City. I've mentioned that before, but that was a a great game, in my opinion, that had a lot of potential. That It did get content updates, but I think the player base just fell off. And for me personally, me and my friends, we stopped playing because people just got way better than us. And we were just getting destroyed in every lobby. And I could do a whole show on... MMR and how your skill-based matchmaking and my thoughts on that. And maybe I will if I'm desperate for topics. You know, that's not really the live service game's fault. All live service games and all multiplayer games are going to have skill-based matchmaking. But again, that's another show. But I want to know, are you playing any of the games I mentioned today? Are you a Fortnite fan? Are you into Roblox? Uh, I know my friends and I tried Roblox once. Uh, It was a lot. And we couldn't really figure it out. But it does have an update like every week on PS5, so I'm sure they're adding new content. But yeah, let me know if you're playing any of these games. Uh, Are you in that 8% that's branching out and playing new games? Or are you more of the casual gamer that's playing the same two or three multiplayer shooters and then hopping off for the day? Let me know. Uh, We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to get into some more of the news. You're listening to No Credits Rolled. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com 
or on the web at insightsintothings.com. All right, and we're back on No Credits Rolled. We just got done talking about some data from New Zoo about what people are playing. But now in this next segment, I decided to call it the News Roundup. I was going to make a cool jingle, but I ran out of time. So just imagine like a cool Old West cowboy song here um, for the News Roundup. Maybe some, I had some whip sound effects that I was pretty proud of. Some cracking, some horse galloping. But that didn't make uh, that didn't make it to air. Maybe one day though. Anyway, so our first story here comes from IGN. Rebecca Valentine over at IGN. She's a fantastic reporter. But it's about the Kotor remake, Knights of the Old Republic. For all my Star Wars fans out there, I know this one probably makes you uh, cringe because we've been we've been teased with this Kotor remake for a long time now. Uh, and I thought it was dead for sure. I thought we weren't going to see any more of it, but alas. Rebecca Valentine over at IGN doing the Lord's work. Uh, she actually interviewed uh, Saber Interactive CEO Matthew Karch, Kark, K-A-R-C-H. Uh, Saber is the team that took over from Aspire to do this KOTOR remake. Uh, if you remember, again for all my Star Wars fans out there, Aspire recently handled the Battlefront collection, the 1 and 2 collection, uh, which was a complete disaster. So maybe it's a good thing they lost the project. Um, but now Saber's doing it, which is cool because Saber, lightsaber, was that on purpose? Maybe, maybe not. But anyway, Rebecca Valentine talked to CEO Matthew Karch, and he said this, quote, it's clear and it's obvious that we're working on this, this being the KOTOR remake. Uh, he said it's been in the press numerous times. What I will say is that the game is alive and well, and we're dedicated to making sure we exceed consumer expectations. Um, you know, a little bit of corporate speak in there, but, um, you know, hey, that's that's something, I guess, you know. Is he saying that just to keep investors in? Is he saying that just to keep the name of the game in the press? Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of all of that. You know, he's, the guy's a CEO, so he's, I feel like he chooses his words very deliberately, especially in situations like this where he knows it's going to get a headline. But ultimately, what does this really mean, right? Uh, I don't think it means a whole lot. Uh, Embracer Group, which Saber left uh, recently, uh, they Embracer Group held an earnings call after Saber left to announce the leaving. And Embracer Group, they implied on the earnings call that the game is still far away, perhaps in a galaxy far, far away. But the uh, like I said, the Kotor remake used to be under development with Aspire. They lost the project because of a lack of progress, which is maybe telling given, given the uh, state of the Battlefront collection, which is essentially the same game ported with no changes, not even any performance improvements. It's the same game that it was 10 years ago. I could do a whole other episode on that as well because I spoke about that Battlefront collection on this show and got very excited and was very let down by it. But anyway, Saber now has the project. When are we going to see this game? I have no idea. I think he was just, you know, uh, Rebecca Valentine probably just wanted to get the uh, the confirmation from him that the game was still out there just to kind of keep it in the public zeitgeist. I have no idea when we're going to see this game. You know, I, I'm, I think it wasn't, I believe there was an, a thing where they took down that trailer that showed Revan, like, remade, that they took it down, but it was because of a music licensing thing, I think. I don't remember. That freaked a lot of people out because they were like, well, if they're taking the trailer down, then are we ever, are going to ever see this game? You know, I feel like this is just, especially with the success of Final Fantasy VII Remake and Rebirth, I feel like the KOTOR Remake, if you give that the same treatment, is going to make you like a bajillion dollars, right? Because people still rave about KOTOR 1 and 2, sort of, mostly 1. I've tried playing them, uh, I just can't really, the game's so old. It's so old. So, <laughs> and I know I, you probably hate me for saying that if you're like above the age of 30 and that was like your favorite Star Wars game ever, but you know, it's old. It's an old game. But again, it's, it's that Final Fantasy VII comparison where that game is also really old, but it's beloved and the remake of it like is incredible. It's, it's, it's a new kind of game. 
And I think that that's the exact same kind of treatment you got to give KOTOR here. I think if you give the KOTOR remake that budget and that, especially that level of production that, that the Final Fantasy remakes have, I think it's a shoe in You know, I think people are going to be looking for something a little bit more than just a graphical upgrade. I think people are going to want, at least people my age, are going to want a gameplay shakeup because the gameplay of that original game, uh, in my opinion, is pretty dated. And it's confusing. Like, that's why I never got particularly far in it. Um, I think if you do something, again, the Final Fantasy comparison, how they changed up and made that a little more active, a little bit more involved, I think it could, you know, have a lot more mass market appeal. And it's Star Wars, so you've already got, you've already got a huge audience built in there. So we'll see where this goes. Like I said, I, I doubt we're going to hear anything about it anytime soon. If we do, I will be pleasantly surprised. And if we do, I hope it's something with some meat on the bones. Anyway, this next story really isn't news, but I put it in the show because I like Helldivers and I want an excuse to talk about it. Uh, we've got Helldivers patch notes, patch one, or sorry, 01.000.200 uh, for all of you keeping track at home. It's, it's that number, patch note. It, always, it added all kinds of new stuff. We got some new planetary hazards, blizzards, and sandstorms. Uh, so far, my friends and I have only experienced the blizzards. Uh, they're very cool. It helps complete the Star Wars fantasy because you feel like you're on Hoth. And the immersiveness of the blizzards, very cool. You can make snowballs and throw snowballs at people. That's fun. Uh, they tweak some enemy spawns, some mission types, adjusted the mechanics of others. There's like a civilian rescue mission. They've They've decreased the number of civilians you have to save, so... I guess morally speaking, our duty to those extra civilians we're leaving behind is a little bit questionable. But hey, we don't make the rules. Uh, some weapons got buff, like the anti-material rifle, which I think is cool. The breaker incendiary and the dominator have all been buffed. And the new heavy machine gun, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, it had its fire rate decrease, but who really noticed? Anyway, like I said, this isn't news. Not really. But I just wanted to include it because I like talking about this game. Uh, if you want more of my thoughts on it, you can listen to last week's episode where my pal Joe and I talked about it for about 30 minutes-ish. Uh, the game continues to be a ton of fun. You know, my friends and I, it's, it's in our rotation now of the games that we regularly play. We've got about four or five games we rotate around with. And Helldivers is definitely at the top. Uh, it's still a ton of fun. And, and every patch, you know, it's something to look forward to. And I haven't really had that experience with the game in a while, I would say maybe back when we were deep in Fortnite and we were checking the patches that, you know, every time they came out to see what new weapons were added, um, we're back there. You know, we're back there with Helldivers 2 and everything they add and every change they make and finding it out in real time is a lot of fun. You know, not necessarily reading the patch notes before you do a couple matches, but then discovering that, oh, there's blizzards now or, oh, this, there's this new environment you can play in. And it, it creates a sense of discovery that I think a lot of games that we, at least my friends and I play, are lacking. You know, we play Apex, we play Siege. We know, for the most part, what we're getting into. But Helldivers has a, a its own kind of, its, its own brand of fun, I think, that makes every mission continue to feel unique and the game overall to just be an absolute slam dunk. Oh, there have also been teases of uh, robot spaceships. I think those might be in the game. I don't know. But that looked cool. I hope they let us fly spaceships. Uh, there was also the very serious reclaiming of Malevolon Creek. There's a whole backstory to that that I missed out on initially, but we've, the collective we, have regained Malevolon Creek, and everybody got a cape for it. And it's things like that that really contribute to the community feeling of this game. You know, there was the, everybody was wondering if they were going to do some kind of April Fool's joke for Helldivers 2, but instead there was this big push to everyone, for all the troopers, or all the players, sorry, players, troopers, you know, who can really tell anymore, to regain these couple planets. And I think the time was 24 hours to do it, but the player base did it in five, which is pretty cool. And then everybody got a commemorative, you know, cosmetic cape to commemorate the event. I don't know. I think stuff like that, like that is cool. It brings me back to when I used to play Star Wars The Old Republic Online, uh, an MMO. But it's that sense, that sense of community, really. And I really don't feel that in a, lot, a whole lot of other games. So, Helldivers 2. Go check it out if you haven't already. 
All right, we're going to take another break. And when we come back, we're going to get into the review portion of the show where I'm going to be talking about Dragon's Dogma 2. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. All right, and we're back on No Credits Rolled. We just got done discussing the news for this week, and now we're going to talk some reviews. This week I'm talking about Dragon's Dogma 2. This review has been a long time coming. Uh, I have been obsessed with this game. Uh, I say that a lot. But when a game captures my imagination and really captures my time, I think it's especially worth talking about on this show. Uh, but Dragon's Dogma 2 is a fantasy action RPG uh, coming from Capcom, developed and published by Capcom. It's using the RE engine, uh, which kind of looks good sometimes. Uh, I'll get more into that in a second. Uh, the game isn't perfect. It's captured my attention since it came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, whenever I'm not online with my friends, this is the game I've been going to. Whenever I'm not in the multiplayer space, I'm booting up Dragon's Dogma 2 and I'm running around. I'm maybe doing a side quest or just existing in this world because it's just so much fun. My top level thoughts on Dragon's Dogma 2. The game is a lot of fun, but it's not without its flaws. It's not a game I can recommend to everyone, but if you can power through the more obtuse aspects of it, the gameplay and the world is where Dragon's Dogma 2 really shines. Some positives I have here. Uh, overall, the, there's like two big positives that I want to highlight. The world is very immersive and feels very lived in and dynamic. I think that's the best way to describe it. There's a lot of dynamic moments that can happen throughout regular gameplay. Uh, for example, the fast travel in the game kind of works where you you take these ox carts, these like these carriages that ride from city to city, and you can you have the option to ride in real time, uh, but I wouldn't recommend that. You can you can doze off, which is essentially skipping time, and your character will just wake up in the next whatever the destination is. But along the way, you can be attacked. You can be attacked by bandits or goblins or griffins or trolls or whatever. And you have to fight those things off. So, and these encounters are completely dynamic. They're not staged. Like it's, I don't know how they did it. Honestly, everything in the world has its own pattern of existing. And when these patterns overlap, you get these really cool dynamic moments. One example of that is the ox carts where you, you wake up and you suddenly have to fight an ogre. You get back on the cart, go to your destination. But while you're fighting that ogre, some goblins might show up or another group of Heroes might show up that are, they're all NPCs. It's not a multiplayer game. But this other troop of adventurers might show up and join in and help you fight. And then after the fact, you can hire some of those people to join your party. Uh, they're called pawns, which is a little dystopian. But they're called pawns and they can join your party as NPCs and help you out. There's, you know, the different classes, which I'll get to in a second. But it's it's moments like that that really stand out for me. Um... For example, there was a I was fighting a griffin, like a big bird monster thing, and then and then a troll showed up, and I was like, "Well, this is going to be tough to fight both." Then they started fighting each other, so I just ran away, and I was like, "Oh, well, that that deals with itself." Uh, time passes in real time, so if you you know if you go to an inn and rest like five times in a row, all the food in your inventory will rot, and you just can't eat any of it. Uh, Different NPCs and cities will go about their daily lives, whether that be a merchant or if, you know, I've got a quest right now where I have to tail this um, this beggar, this, like, homeless guy. But he walks a specific route during the day before he posts up where he does his show, like his little 
act, I guess, where you have to meet him. So I'm like waiting all day for him to show up to the spot and he, I'm still waiting. And you know, as the time goes by and I'm just sitting on this bench waiting for this guy to show up because it's, it's the pattern he does in his daily life. Uh, the combat is the other big standout of the game. Uh, I'm playing as a warrior, which is an extra class you get in the game. I think the initial classes, they're called vocations, but they're basically classes. It's like your typical affair, your, your thief class, your wizard class, your warrior class. And then you can unlock a handful more as you go, depending on if you find certain weapon types that allows you to unlock the other branches. But the warrior, he has a big giant sword. And that was why I, I went for that vocation, because I think that's cool. Uh, and I think anytime I can get a big giant sword, I'm I'm going to get a big giant sword. But one of the mechanics in the game for when you're fighting these larger enemies like trolls and ogres and things like that, there's a stagger system. Oh, there's also minotaurs. Don't forget about the minotaurs. There's a stagger system and a, and a balance system. So you can knock enemies off balance and then push them over and then crawl on them and continue to do damage. But that that uh, that balance and the way they fall is all dynamic. So if you push them off a like a bridge, they'll just fall, and that's it. That's the end of the, their story. Um, there's a clip that, if I can remember, I'll put it in for the video version of the show. But I was I was fighting this ogre or cyclops, and I climbed up on its head. If you've ever played Shadow of the Colossus, it's a lot like that, but on a smaller scale. You know, you're not fighting colossi, but you know they're like 50, 40 feet tall. So I climb up on this ogre's head, and I, I with my big giant sword, I, I drive the sword into his head, and like if you hold down Y, you do the heavy attack, but if you if you continue to hold it down, you do it even longer. So I drive the sword into his head, and then I yank it out as he's falling, and it kills him. But it was like the most epic thing I've done in the game in a very long time, and it was all dynamic. Like I had to climb up on the guy's back, I had to get in the right position so that the heavy attack would trigger. And I had to hold it and risk the extra time, you know, hanging on to this guy to do the maximum amount of damage and take him out. And I've done that maneuver multiple times because if you have a big giant sword, you're going to use it. And it never gets old. Like, it, this game makes you feel so cool when you do your abilities and you, and you figure things out. And it's, it's really, really impressive. And it's why I keep coming back to it, that and the dynamic world. Uh, different pawns can do different things. So if you've got, like... Uh, an archer in your class or in your party rather, you know, he'll start firing before you even get to the fight with your sword and he can take a couple guys out. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, I highly recommend you play this game because you can definitely convince yourself that it's a Lord of the Rings game with, you know, you've got your Legolas, you have your archer, you can, you can make your guy just look like Gandalf. So you can have a Gandalf kind of wizard. You can have your Aragorn. It, it's, it's enough of the fantasy of Lord of the Rings for me that I can sell it. Um, you can imbue your weapons with elemental abilities. So there was a moment, another little anecdote, where I was climbing like this hill and I was leading the party. So some of my party members had fallen behind and one of them got caught in a uh, slime, like sentient slime, and they were being like devoured. So I turn around and I pull my sword out and my you can give pawn commands to like tell your pawns to attack or to heal you or to stay behind or whatever. So I tell them to attack and my mage in my party charges up my sword with lightning and I run down the hill and I leap off the hill and I come down on the slime and hit it with the, my electric sword. And it was like, it's just, it was so cool. And the moment came out of nowhere. It wasn't part of a main quest. It wasn't scripted. This moment was completely dynamic. And, you know, I felt like the coolest kid on planet earth doing this cool jump. And I think that's really what makes this game so special is that these these awesome moments, these epic moments that you want to clip and send to all your friends, they can happen at any time. And it's really like it's it's really impressive and it's it's something that I haven't really experienced since I would compare it to a Baldur's Gate, but obviously the combat in Baldur's Gate is a lot different. It's not as in the moment real time because it is turn-based. But that sense of you do something and it works and you feel really cool and and you know, you pat yourself on the back for it. Definitely comes up a lot in this game. I already mentioned the crawling on enemies. It's awesome. And I recommend if you do buy the game, you do it as often as you can. Because you can hit different weak points and you can knock weapons out of people's hands. Or you can do different attacks depending on where you are on the monster's body. 
Really, really neat stuff. Again, if you played Shadow of the Colossus, it's a little bit like that in terms of the feeling of climbing around. I think the soundtrack to the game is pretty good, too. Uh, it's nothing, like, crazy, right? It's your standard fantasy epic music. But I think it really helps to punctuate those big moments, especially if they're happening outside of a main quest, and you just do something cool and the music is going way harder than it needs to just to you know really back up that moment. I think it does a great job there. Now, I do have some negatives for the game. You know, no game is perfect. And I think this one, this game in particular, I think has some issues that might immediately turn some people off, despite the fact that I'm raving about it. Uh, the performance of the game, the technical performance, not great. Uh, I'm playing on an Xbox Series X, so I've seen some folks on PC with like ridiculous rigs that are getting much more impressive performance. But if you're a console gamer, you're going to experience some chugging. Uh, frame rates drop left and right, especially in large areas like a city or during um, hectic moments of combat. You're going to be, you're very rarely going to be at a steady 60 FPS. There also aren't a whole lot of visual settings in the game on console side. You can't turn off motion blur. You can't adjust your, there, there really aren't many things you can adjust. There's no performance versus um, resolution settings, which is always annoying for me because I'm a big stickler for frame rate. Uh, I dunk on Pokemon a lot, uh, Scarlet and Violet, because of how terrible that game runs. But <laughs> for me, like this is, I can understand why people played so much Pokemon because despite the technical issues of this game, I'm still playing a ton of it. Right, I'm able to look past the frame rate drops and the the chugging that the game encounters just because I'm having so much fun. So, you know, for those Pokemon fans out there that I, I bashed your game, I, I do apologize. I see the I see the appeal now. It's just for me, frame rate's such a big thing that I notice so like immediately. Um, but to this game's credit, it's so much fun that I'm able to look past it. So, uh, the in terms of story, the plot is really not present um i mean there is a story but i am not really paying attention to it because it's mostly delivered through large exposition dumps um as so far that i can tell uh, you are the arisen that's like your character's title uh, there's a cool cut scene in the beginning of the game this isn't really a spoiler it's in like the first like hour where you're fighting this like giant dragon and the dragon like completely he, he basically kills you uh, and then he rips your heart out and eats it. Um, but that makes you the Arisen. So that allows you to enter this like spirit realm and summon pawns. And that's about as much of the story as I have grasped so far. Like I said, uh, I'm not a big story guy. I, I have definitely missed a lot of things. And, and that's a complaint. That's a, that's a me problem for sure. Uh, I have a difficult time following the stories of most games because I don't really pay attention. Uh, I'm mostly in it for gameplay. Unless it's something I deliberately lock in and pay attention to the story for and, and turn off other distractions. But for this game, I wasn't really taking the story super seriously uh, because I was having so much fun with the gameplay. But if you are someone that wants a narrative-focused, a narrative-forward game, especially when it comes to these fantasy RPGs, I wouldn't necessarily say that's where this game shines. This game shines in your combat and in just existing in this world. Uh, another thing that I didn't know going in is that everybody talks like they're in a Shakespearean play. I guess they were trying to go for like a period piece thing with the dialogue. Uh, it's really weird and off-putting at first, <laughs> uh, especially if you're not used to people talking that way because, you know, we, we're in 2024 and, um, you know, I, I certainly don't talk like I'm in Othello, but everyone in this game does. Uh, and it does take some getting used to, but... Once you get used to it, it's not that bad. I only have it down as a negative because for me it was so jarring at first that I had to do extra mental gymnastics to figure out what people were saying to me. Um, but yeah, everybody kind of talks with that, like, I don't know if it's Shakespearean or medieval. If you've ever gone to the Ren Fair and, like, people do that fake English accent and they and they use, like, they say ye and things like that, it, it's like that. Uh, and it's a little weird, but again, you get used to it relatively quickly. Uh, the save system is not great. Uh, I don't think anything will ever top Baldur's Gate save system or it's like two buttons to quick save. And this one you can quick save, but it's not super accurate. You know, it's not, I quick save right before I do this fight 
I go into the fight, I die, I get a party wipe, I can immediately reload to that point. It's a little bit looser with where that save point's actually going to restore you. Uh, I've lost a lot of progress because I neglected to save regularly, and when you die, which by the way, you can die like really easily, uh, water, at least at this point in the game, if you fall in water, like you just instantly die. The water is like evil. I don't know if I missed something, but if you or your pawns go in the water, all these like tentacles come out and kill you. Uh, your pawns instantly die from that. You will take a hit of your health, but then get spawned back on shore. But if you, if you fall in and that chunk of health they take kills you, then you're, you are dead. Uh, not really sure what the deal is with that. You do have a main pawn that you pick at the beginning of the game, and that pawn can always be revived at, there's like spirit stones. You can always revive that pawn. So you're not getting complete party wipes. But I have had it where I'm journeying from one city to the next on foot, and all my pawns fall off a cliff into the into the river and die, and I, I'm alone until I get to town and can revive my other pawn. And that ties back in with the save system, because when you die... You can either load your last save or you can load your last in rest when you rest at an in. And it doesn't tell you the time on that. It doesn't tell you how long it, it's been since you've done either of those things. So there was a moment in the beginning of the game where I hit the load, uh, the last in rest, because I was like, I don't I don't know what when either was, when I saved or when I last rested. Yeah, I ended up losing like an hour and a half of gameplay. So <laughs> my recommendation is if you're playing, um, save often and note. You don't have to literally note it, but just kind of mentally note when you rest at these inns. And it's tough at first because the inns are expensive to rest at. You get money pretty quickly. But in the beginning of the game, you're not always able to rest at an inn because it's like 2,000 gold, which you don't have that kind of money in the beginning of the game. I think it would be a pretty easy fix if they just added times like if they said this was the time you last saved versus this was the time you last rested at an inn seems like a pretty easy fix but and if you listen to other reviews about this game there is a a ps3 an xbox 360-ness about this game that is tough to describe uh if you played the original dragon's dogma which i played a little bit of it it this sequel like 10 years later feels like it could have came out relatively recently after the first game aspects of this game feel old but like i don't know if it's a bad thing i don't know if it's a bad thing honestly i think they 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 stuck to their guns on what they wanted to do and you know i admire that but there are some quality of life things that you might expect from a modern rpg that are not necessarily in this game i mentioned the saves uh what else oh there's only two races um, that you can choose from to create your character. The character creator is very detailed in terms of sculpting and proportions and dimensions of your character. But the two races are human or cat person. So you got to be okay with one of those. Uh, I went with a cat person just because I thought he looked cool. I made him like a lion man. But like, it's it's crazy to me that those are the two choices. It's it's like, like were there cat people on like not literally cat people on the development team but people that just liked cats and were like we're sticking to this we're putting cat people in this game i don't know it's very strange um but those are your choices and maybe there's a lore reason i think people like discriminate against the cat people i've noticed some dialogue about that again not really paying attention to that that's my fault but if you're if you want to play as like an elf there are elves in the game i've met some but you can't make your character one so i don't know that's a little weird and that's one of those things that makes it feel a little bit dated And then, yeah, the frame rate is also what makes it feel dated because, you know, 30 FPS is bringing me back to to 2012. But if you're a fantasy action fan and you've got a tolerance to learn the game's mechanics, which they do take some getting used to, and it does take a little bit to find your flow in this game, I think the payoff is very much worth it. Uh, It's always nice to feel cool in a game, and you can feel cool in this game pretty regularly. Uh, The game can also make you feel like a moron, uh, if you try to do something cool and like completely fall on your face, like there have been multiple times where I've I've tried to crawl on a um an orc or, or not an orc, an ogre or something, crawl up on it, and I, I leap off and I try to do this big attack and I completely whiff and just face plant and you know take a chunk of my health off because I just hit the ground. Uh just yesterday when I was playing, um you can knock large enemies across 
destroyed bridges and used them as a bridge to get across, which was very cool the first time I discovered that. So I knock this ogre across this destroyed bridge and all my I'm trying to get my party across so we can cross this river. And my pawns continue to attack the ogre, so the ogre falls and everybody dies because we fell in the river. So kind of a cool moment for a second there, and then you know the the game's not <laughs> the game's not perfect and you there is a little bit of jank to it, uh, which I discovered the hard way. Uh but yeah, uh let me know if you're playing Dragon's Dogma 2. Does it appeal to you? If you have played it, let me know what you think. Uh, but those are my thoughts on the game. I uh, I hope I hope they were satisfactory. All right, really quickly, I wasn't sure I was going to include this, but it's something I'm having a lot of fun with. So we're going to talk about Marvel Snap again, everybody. I'm desperately waiting for that sponsorship. I'm sure the check is in the mail. Uh, but it's a new season of Marvel Snap, dropped just a couple days ago at the time of recording. The season actually snuck up on me. Uh, I didn't know what was happening. Usually I check and see how much time is left in the current season, but this one kind of just came out of nowhere. Uh, It's Thunderbolts themed. If you're a Marvel fan, I think that Thunderbolts movie is coming out eventually. I don't know. Uh, But the season pass card is Baron Zemo, who if you watch the Winter Soldier show, Falcon Winter Soldier, he's in that. It's like not the same guy, but same name, I guess. Uh, You can also get Red Hulk now. Um, And I'm only mentioning this because Red Hulk was one of my favorite characters when I got into comics. That Greg Pak Incredible Hulk run got me into comics, uh, and and thirteen year old Sam thought Red Hulk was cool because he had a gun. Uh, I stand by that, by the way. I, I, it, it was cool, and he's like Green Hulk, but he's red, so pretty neat. Anyway, uh, Red Hulk he's a counter for one of the more popular decks in the game, the the High Evo Hulk deck. Uh, if you play Marvel Snap, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but it's it's refreshing to kind of get that. I know Second Dinner, when they talk about developing for this game and releasing new cards, they always talk about release valves, right? If there's a mechanic in the game that some players find frustrating or that's becoming too dominant, they like to put a release valve in the game to kind of uh, offer a little bit of a counter for that, maybe that annoying mechanic. And that's what Red Hulk is here. So I'm really looking forward to this season. I'm back in. I've been playing a lot more. Uh, I took a little bit of a break a couple seasons ago, but I'm definitely, I'm playing at least once a day now. Uh, and I'm having a lot of fun. I think Zemo's ability, he allows you to recruit deck uh, cards from the enemy deck so you can steal cards from them and play them. I think it's kind of a new archetype that's a lot of fun. Uh, and like I said, you know, again, the game is free. Uh, if you have any interest in Marvel or card games or anything, considering it's a free mobile game, it is very lightly monetized. Now, there is a shop with lots of egregious bundles you can buy, but you're not getting a pop-up ad. You're not getting banner ads. I think it's very uh, tame when it comes to a mobile game. But it's one of my favorite games, and I'm going to keep bringing it up on the show uh, whenever (laughs) I feel like it. Uh, But yeah, uh, let me know if you're playing Marvel Snap, if I've convinced any of you to come over and play the game. Um, It's it's a ton of fun, and and, I think it's got ever more potential that it continues to realize. But anyway, that's going to wrap things up for Episode 6 of No Credits Rolled. Thanks so much for watching. I just want to remind everyone you can email questions or comments to nocreditsrolled at gmail.com. That's nocreditsrolled at gmail.com. Like I said at the top of the show, we've got a call in line. You can call in and leave us a voicemail at 856-209-0713. That's 856-209-0713. And we just might play it on the air. Make sure to subscribe to No Credits Rolled on Spotify, Apple, and wherever you get your podcast. And if you're feeling generous, make sure you check out the Patreon. Every little bit helps. That's going to wrap it up for Episode 6 today. I'll see you next time on No Credits Rolled.